here in Salt Lake City with my, uh, my wife Chrissy and my, uh, my four kids. And um, I was part of a, uh, a metal band that would tour around and um, because of that I started a YouTube channel in my kitchen um, just to stay connected with our, our fan base and um, connect with people. And um, I would, I, at the end of these YouTube videos, I would just say, uh, if you know you need encouragement, if you need anything, if you need help, um, you just want someone to talk to, um, you know, if you just have a need, feel free to email me and I leave my email address. And um, in the fall of 2015, um, I, I got an email from a young um, teenage kid from, from France. And um, she was in what seemed like the beginning stages of a, of a, of a pretty bad situation in her home. And I, I wasn't sure if it was real or not, so I had my, my wife and uh, my, ad, my uh, administrative assistant, I said, can you please reach out to this person? I, I don't, uh, tell me if this is real, if this seems real to you. And unfortunately it was, and so we, we actually ended up helping um, to get them t taken from that, that spot. And, and uh, they ended up at kind of like a, um, like a youth center. And um, right, right after, shortly after the, if you guys will remember like the Paris bombing, um, shortly after that, one of the members of her family uh, came to the organization that she was staying at and um, uh, took her out, uh, kidnapped her out of that organization and trafficked her uh, to Paris. And uh, she was found some days later by the authorities. They, they were able to track the people that came to the organization. They found her and took her and I want to say 15 other kids, 15 other girls out of this uh, brothel in, in the Paris area. And it was so outlandish and unreal that I, my wife and I both were like, I, I can't believe that this is happening. Um, but our hearts really like bonded with this, this kid. We really had a deep sense of, of love and appreciation for her and we just couldn't believe that it was happening. And so um, I went as far as like, we really began talking with the organization. Like, is there any way we could maybe even adopt this, this girl? She was as old as my oldest daughter um, at the time. Uh, Marin was like 15 and a half or nearly 16. They were like the same age. And I, I just couldn't believe that someone like my daughter was going through this stuff. And so we really, we really wanted to be a part of her life. We wanted her to know that she, she could feel love even in the midst of this stuff. And, and unfortunately, um, just because she went through a period of, of such crazy sexual abuse, her body got really sick and um, she passed away uh, in 2016. And it, it spun us for a loop because, I mean, we're here in Utah, like I'm in Salt Lake City. I, I couldn't believe that even though we were sort of separated by continents that we were so, we were being impacted by this person's story that without us paying attention, she would have just like been lost like and, and forgotten um, and that's it. And that happens a lot. And so before she passed away, I remember telling her, um, even though it cost her so much, that she had set more people free in 15 years than some people will their whole life. And she, she told me, you know, I, I know that I was loved and I know that I have a family. And, uh, and, and she said, Tommy, you have to keep sharing because there's many more like me. And I, I really didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know where to, where to put that. And so after she passed away, you know, my wife and I, we shared it with some of our close friends and family and people grieved with us a little bit, but it was so crazy. I mean, it was like a movie. It was, it, it, it was so unreal that it had happened that we really didn't know what to do with it. And um, that, was, that was towards the fall of 2016. So it's now, you know, May <laughs> 2018. It's been a while. And about eight or nine months ago, um, like I said, I have four kids and I'm trying not to be, trying to keep it hot, I want to be a hot dad for my wifey and me. And I was on a run, I was on a jog on the um, Jordan River Trail and just trying to get into running again. This is probably like, yeah, like December of, of 2017, just running. And I remember feeling almost this thing come up in me. Um, I have some amazing friends that have done really good work and all over the world. And so I know people that have done incredible things, but. I usually think it's their story. And so I'm, I'm jogging and it was as if there was like the, these waves of inspiration that just hit. And it was, um, I'm gonna run across the state of Utah. I'm gonna tell this kid's story. We're gonna write it down in a book. It's gonna become a bestseller. 
we're gonna rescue a bunch of kids. And I just, I started crying and I, I came home and I walked in and told uh, my, my, my beautiful wife, Chrissy, I said, I, I, think that, I think this is something that I can do. And um, that sort of led into this insane journey <laughs> of, of uh, me thinking, I'm gonna run from the top of Utah to the bottom of Utah and I'm gonna talk about this issue of human trafficking and, and the fact that there's very real people that are not in movies that are going through this crazy suffering. And if people don't stop and pay attention, if they don't share love and compassion, if they don't pay attention to these things and, and care, um, these, these kids are gonna be lost. And, and um, so that, that began like this, this journey for me of, I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run 430 miles. I'm gonna run, a, a, apparently, it's like 14 days of about a marathon or more a day. And I, I've never done that before, but I, I love running and, and I, I, I think I'm gonna go through a hard thing because these kids have gone through such a hard thing. And uh, I want people to understand that beauty maybe um, in the midst of the suffering and, and I want to open people's hearts. So um, what's ended up happening is my, my wife has been uh, uh, contacted and she's actually gonna, um, she's begun writing um, a, a memoir, the story of what we've gone through, and we're hoping that this will help put a face and a name to this um, this practice that's happening all over the world, happening in America, happening in Europe, happening in Asia, happening all over the place. That human trafficking is a real issue, and so uh, Chrissy's doing this beautiful creative work and sharing the story. And we, I was just going to run, and it was almost like just going to be a publicity stunt for Chrissy's project. <laughs> I just wanted people to pay attention to this story and didn't know how else to to maybe call the nation to pay attention look at this like have, do you guys know this is happening i didn't know it was real like this until it invaded my world and so that was all it was and then about a month ago i was in uh, san jose at a uh, at an event and chrissy hit me up and said did you get that email and i said no what email she said look in your phone and i opened it up and one of the other girls that was taken out of that brothel um, emailed Chrissy and I and said, about a year and a half ago, this, this precious girl gave me your email addresses when she helped us get rescued from a bar in Paris. She said if I was ever in trouble that I could, I could call her mom, meaning Chrissy. And so we, we decided to take it, this a lot more serious um, when that happened. And so outside of just thinking this was a creative project and a publicity stunt, um, something happened when we began to contact this other survivor that knew this precious person that our hearts just really loved and to find out more of her story and the depth of what had gone on was deeply insightful, powerful, beautiful, and, and, and tragic all at the same time. And so we decided that what initially was just gonna be a run um, across the state to try to get uh, Utah to stand up, um, we actually launched a nonprofit and we just have filed it and we're just like a month into this journey, but our nonprofit is called Run Against Traffic. And so our first huge event is gonna be your boy here running from the top of Utah to the bottom of Utah. And I'm, my goal is to raise um, a significant amount of money um, not just to help aid the rescue and rehabilitation of some of these people and to provide resources for individuals and organizations that are actually directly helping these people. Um, but the, the, the real thing that I think would actually be a, a long-term um, project for our organization is to actually uh, create a bunch of road races, you know, 5Ks and 10Ks and marathons and utilize this transformative thing of running and what it can mean for people. If you've ever done training for a run, it'll change your life. And, and so I know people are really looking for an opportunity to be transformed in their own personal story. But I also think that cause, I have a mentor that says cause creates community. And so I'm hoping that this cause of human trafficking and these running events will create community resource and people that are willing to be a hero for someone else, to, to be selfless and to serve someone else's um, story, to help someone else come out of something. And so um, 
our, our goal, my goal by the end of October is to have run from the top of Utah to the bottom of Utah to raise like hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to uh, provide resource for these other organizations and also as almost like a, the beginning stages of what will be our, our budget for our, our first handful of races um, in the Salt Lake area, in Utah, and hopefully in other states where human trafficking um, resonates with the people of those communities and they want to do this as well. So welcome to the birth of Run Against Traffic. Um, I, I would love and appreciate your support and I uh, wanted to let everybody know like there will be more of these kind of video updates that are coming and uh, I will be doing my best to update you guys even live on the run. Um, we're about 22 weeks away from my run, uh, my run against traffic, uh, which will go from the top of Utah to the bottom of Utah, um, starting at the Utah-Idaho border and ending in St. George, Utah um, in October. So welcome to Run Against Traffic, and um, I look forward to suffer camp that I'm going to go on. <laughs> so if you uh, if you would like to support, there will be a link connected to the video. Um, you can check out our website and follow us on, on Facebook and all the applicable social media. Please spread it around as um, I, I do want to raise people's awareness and I'm realizing now we have a pretty significant goal in mind and so please share it and, uh, and give what you can and um, show up and give me a high five if you're in Utah. If you feel like uh, struggling with me, you can come and run a little bit. Um, but this is just going to be a passion project, and then we're going we're gonna to set the state on fire. It'll be awesome. So thank you, guys. Okay. So uh, that was Tommy Green. That was a year ago he made that video. That is the founder. Him and his wife are the founder of Run Against Traffic. Uh, Brian Bain. Brian, can you make it up here? You want a chair? This is what happens when you decide to run against traffic. <laughs> Literally. So um, next week on Saturday, we're going to do our Run Against Traffic 5K. Uh, Brian has been passionately organizing this for the last couple of months. And so this is our last push for it. I thought Brian would share. It was important that this video got played so you could kind of see Tommy and his heart and kind of how it came to be. I know a lot of you were talking during that. Hopefully some of you caught the uh, uh, set story, sorry, the story and the spirit of that story to understand why Brian is so passionate about this. So Brian, you want to share a little bit? So I, I first saw that uh, video in October and immediately in my heart, like I, I just could not not do something. Uh, it, it moved me. Uh, if I remember, I'm pretty sure it moved me to tears. I was sitting in my classroom on a Saturday morning just doing some work. And, yeah, it was, it's just powerful. So if you didn't get a chance to see that whole thing, you can go on to the Facebook uh, page. for. If you just search who runs against traffic, it's on there. So we're about a week away. And as you can tell, I'm a little less uh, able to do what I wanted to do. I'm obviously not going to run in it anymore. But this, this week has been a challenge, to be honest with you, between – my injury and a few other things like logistically, it's clear that uh, Jake Burns really encouraged me. He said, it's clear that you're trying to take some really good land because you're coming across some big challenges. So that's not gonna, I'm not going to let that stop me. I know, that, uh, I know that the Lord wants me to do this. And I know that some great things are going to come about. So with that said, we could still definitely use some volunteers, especially Saturday morning with some setup. So if you're willing to do that, please just come and see me. There's also a link on the Facebook event page where you can sign up to be a volunteer. That's, it would be best if you did that so I can kind of logistically do it from my laptop. I know that would help me out. And also, if you did sign up already, make sure you're checking your email because I sent some emails out just about some schedules and things that need to be done. And if you didn't sign up yet, it's not too late to run, walk, or do the one-mile fun run if the kids want to do that. You can also sign up uh, via that same site. And if you don't want to do that, we're still taking donations for sure. Uh, we, have, we haven't quite reached our goal yet. So our goal was $5,000, and we still are, are on our way there. So, um, and also, please just pray for the event. Tommy, I confirm, I talked to him this week. He is coming. 
uh, to the event, and he is super excited, especially with the location. We're doing it around our school district, and I really want that to be impactful, not just for Greencastle, but for every school in this area and across the nation, that as you are running and walking, that you are thinking about those kids and also uh, just what they, the impact that this could be on them. There's also the silent art auction that went live yesterday. Lauren has really done a great job of organizing that and gotten some of her artist friends and her own work. Um, so if you would like to uh, bid on those, you can go online. I posted that and I will also post it again. Uh, actually, I'll go back and post it again so you can see it. And you can just bid on there through a Google form. It's super easy. You can see all of the uh, pieces that are available. And I think that's, I think that's about it. If you have any other questions, please come and see me uh, sometime during the service. I thank you so much for your support. I'm really excited about this. Thank you so much, Mark, for your support, too. I think I can speak on behalf of the whole Who family. Brian, we're really proud of you. We're really proud of you. He came to me a couple of months ago, and if I can open his heart for him he came to me like a little like struggle a little bit with his identity and what his purpose in life was and it was so within weeks of that meeting this thing happened in him and i just i'm seeing a brian that i've always believed was there and i'm just really honored to know you and i'm excited about where this is going so good job man good job yeah Happy Easter. Let's do it. He is risen. Yes, he has. Let's stand to our feet. Let's worship a risen, victorious king who's in love with all of mankind. Father, thank you for Jesus. Come on, let's thank him. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus' death. Thank you for Jesus' burial. And thank you for Jesus' resurrection. Today, Lord God, we all stand in the power of this resurrection. We stand in this victory that love is stronger than death. And thank you, Lord God, that resurrection power was not 2,000 years ago only, but now is swelling and growing and burgeoning on the inside of a people who are in love with the Father. The Father, sons and daughters walking in this victory, walking in this resurrection power. Let our songs today, let our worship today, let that which comes out of us today declare the glory of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who lives forevermore.
Jesus. 
chapter of Luke that recounts the encounter and the revelation that Jesus is risen. Sorry. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they had found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one? among the dead he is not here but he is risen remember how he spoke to you while you were still in Galilee saying that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again and they remembered they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest and now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James. Also the other women that were with them were telling though these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense. And they would not believe them. But Peter. But Peter. Peter stood up and ran to the tomb, stopping and looking in. And he saw the linen wrappings only. And he went away to his home, marveling at the thing that happened. I have been so struck with the words, but Peter, this morning. As the women come and they, they're proclaiming that Jesus has risen, it sounds like nonsense to the very apostles that walked with Jesus and he told them this is going to happen and the thing that he said was going to happen is being reported to them and it sounds like nonsense but Peter here is Peter just a few days earlier denying Jesus himself Peter resurrects that's what resurrects means stands up Peter resurrects from his denial and runs to the tomb but Peter and our lives way too many times believe that what's being told to us is nonsense and we don't have enough but Peters in our life the but Peter part of you that believes that thing can be resurrected the thing that you're believing in maybe it's radical healing maybe it's a saving of a marriage maybe it's a child coming home maybe it's for your finances maybe it's for I don't know what it is but are you going to be the nonsense here or are you but Peter and 
And I can only stand here and ask for repentance when my ears have only heard nonsense, when my spirit is saying, but Peter, run, run. Stand up and run. So I want to actually, I want to bless you with but Peter. But you got to stand up. And I don't mean you just need to physically stand up, but in your heart and in your mind and in your spirit, there needs to be something that resurrects you from your doubt. That resurrects you from the denial of what the Lord has said your life is all about. But Peter, but Peter, Father, I myself repent for the times that I've heard your words and it has sounded like nonsense to me. Father, for hearing the report of the Lord and attaching possibility next to it or impossibility next to it. Lord, your word, your breath is life. It is life abundantly. So, Father, over these people right now, I bless them with a resurrection but Peter attitude. Father, a but Peter mindset. One that will look in the face of doubt and look in the face of even my own denial and be resurrected to run to you. This is our family, a family that holds resurrection power inside of us because Jesus is inside of us. Because you, Lord, reside not only at the right hand of the Father, but the right hand of the Father is right here, right in my heart. And I will believe that more than I will believe the reports of the news media of the doubters of those who don't believe but Peter so now family I'll ask you is he risen no is he risen is he risen is he risen in your life I know for me, he is risen, and he is king, and I will crown him with every crown of every kingdom of my life. We thank you for the cross.
It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. And it is done. Old things have passed away. New things have come. How many new things are in the house today? Jesus, you finished what you came on earth to do. And now everybody say, it's my turn. No, 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 I didn't even hear that. Say, it's my turn. You finished your part. And now your resurrection is inside of us. The very life, the very love that could not keep you dead lives on the inside of us. And now it's our turn to cover the earth with glory like the waters cover the seas. It is our turn. Father, in this house, we take this seriously. This isn't a church service. This isn't a, a year annual event. Resurrection is our lifestyle. Resurrection is who you are. Therefore, resurrection is who we are. You came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly in super quality and quantity. So we're here to remind ourselves and one another that life is in us. We have the ushers come. Just come on up and bring your offering. Anything you want to give to the Lord to advance the kingdom in the earth through world harvest. We take what you give seriously. We honor it. We ask that the Father bless this seed back into your life. 30, 60, and 100 fold blessing. Even the Deuteronomy, thousand fold blessing. Think about what you're given today. Ask the Lord what would a thousand fold return look like. I ask for it, Lord, in your lives, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's take, well, I always say two or three minutes and it turns into longer than that, but let's take a couple minutes and just greet somebody today. Go find someone, love on them. Like we did this before, if someone stays sitting, go sit on their lap and tell them, I am here, you should not have sat. I'm going, I'm finding somebody.
I'm doing it. <laughs> she comes out. <laughs> Love you guys. Okay, okay, knock it off. Is that it? That's it? You don't even give me a hug.
Okay, let's do this. So uh, <clears throat> I just want to do this really quick before we release the kids. I want to pray for the churches in Sri Lanka. As of now, 207 people have been killed. Over 450 injured. Targeting churches on Easter. Father, grace, grace. Spirit of peace, come to every family, to every person, every church member, every leader, that whole nation. Draw near, Holy Spirit. Bathe that country in your love. And I even ask, especially for those responsible. They are not our enemy. They might consider themselves our enemy, but we do not call them our enemy. May they experience this love. Father, may those that committed these acts experience what Paul experienced on the road to Damascus. And may all those, Lord God, who have suffered loss today, who are in pain right now, who are physically changed because of this, emotionally changed because of this, Father, I ask that the heart would open in such a way that they would see and experience you in a way they could not have. I ask, Lord God, as the Redeemer of all things, that you would cause this evil thing to be turned around for good. Redeem this like you are so faithful to do, over and over again. Let the blood that was spilt cause a nation to turn. Thank you, Lord. Be present there. Be deeply involved in every life. And for those, Lord God, who hate who we are and who we love, we pray especially for them all around the world that you would visit them, Jesus, in dreams that you would show up in their hatred. Be truth. Be light in that darkness. Because the darker the darkness is, the easier the light is to see. And that's what we pray for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, kids. All right, if you've never been here before, if you're a visitor or whatever, I think it's all children that way. Am I right, Joss? Follow anyone that looks roughly the same height as you.
All right, we're going to start in Ephesians 4. All right, the uh, terrible drawing that's in front of you will continue and get worse. <clears throat> and I need to clean it a little bit because it looks like uh, some people didn't like these two bottom verses here. <clears throat> anyway, they were Job and Ecclesiastes. I want to. Uh, I don't know what pastor thinks it's a good idea to finish a series on Easter when a lot of people only go to church on Easter. <laughs> uh, but you know, it takes a guy like me to do that. <clears throat> so let me just quickly uh, summarize what I had done previous two weeks leading up to this. Uh, for lack of a better term, I'm calling this the story of us, the story of man, kind of where we came from and where we're going. Uh, and I don't mean geographically or on a journey of any kind. I'm talking about within us as humanity. I started out here in Psalm 139. I believe, and there is a growing understanding of this in the earth, of going back to an original theology that the disciples had, that we were not born sinful. Okay? Some of you in this room today might still believe or have that understanding that we were born dark-hearted, we were born with sin in our veins. That is not biblical. And I, I would love to go back and go over all these with you, but like I said, I'm in the third Sunday, and we're talking about resurrection today, but it's important that you understand that we, our spirit comes from God, and we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the womb of our mother by the Father. And we enter into a world, Romans chapter 5, fraught with sin. And that is how we sin. Romans 3 says, we all have sinned. We all have sinned and we fall short of the glory God originally intended for us. Okay? Psalm 139 talks about this. The other verses that were erased talked about that. And so what happens is sin enters into the world and then we're born into this sinful place. And as this unhappy person shows you that we become this other person. And I talked about from uh, the book of Romans a lot about how <clears throat> we walk according to the flesh. This flesh that we talked about. I, I spent a lot of time from uh, Genesis chapter 3 where Adam and Eve ate of the, gar ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. And as a result of this, they created a whole identity that God never authored. And the Bible in the New Testament uses the term flesh here to describe that identity that's not us. We call it a false identity here. It's an identity that we create outside of relationship with the Father, in relationship with the world and other people, mostly based upon our own decisions. And if you're sitting over there, I'm sorry, you can't see the board. What can I do for you, Beckering? You're just going to have to live with it, okay? You chose the seat, not me. Okay. So as a result, over time, this other person gets layered on top of this originally beautifully designed person called or me, okay? This is original you. This is a false version of you, and this version of you is created through experiences on this earth, through uh, relationships with the world, and you get offended, and you get hurt, and you get insecure, and I forget what these other words are, but they were really important, and they were awful, and it's a result of our relationship with sin in the world, and it, cause, it creates a false version of us, and I just summarized two weeks' worth of messages right there. How are we doing? Are we Okay. You're all right. All right. So I want to tie in Ephesians chapter 4 here and then move forward from this place. Verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 4. Are you all there? If you have a Bible, could you open it with me? Because I think it's important that you read from your Bible that you have. So when you take it home, I don't know about you. I love reading my paper Bible. And then if I read it enough, I start remembering where things are on the page. Anybody? I think it's important to do that. I, I love electronics and the ability to quickly get to a scripture if you need it. And I, I, I use my electronic Bible a lot, whether it's on my phone or on my computer. But my paper Bible, I don't know, it feels like it gets in me more. I don't know why. So anyway, that's my opinion. That's not biblical truth. Okay, 
So this I say and affirm together with the Lord. This is Paul speaking, and he believes that he is speaking together with the Lord. That you, I'm in verse 17. You there? Okay, Joyce, thank you. That you know that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk. And I just want to take the term because Paul was a Jew. And even though he's making a differentiation between Jews and Gentiles, I really think it could be easily said, people that don't know the Lord. Because Jews walk just like Gentiles in this time. They just practice some things, but their hearts were in the exact same condition. This condition. That you no longer walk just as the Gentiles walk. Someone that doesn't know the Lord. In the uselessness of their mind. I know you have the word futility there if you have the NAS. But the word actually means uselessness of coming to no fruit, being darkened in their understanding. Last week I talked about how the veil comes over our hearts when we walk outside of relationship with the Father, creating another version of our own selves. It's as if a veil is covering us. I think that's another good term for this false identity or flesh. We're being darkened in our own understanding. I think this one hurts me the worst. Excluded from the life of God. When we walk as the Gentiles walk, as we walk outside of our original identity in the Father, we're excluded from the life of God. God doesn't exclude us from that life. We do. Our own choices, our own decisions actually separate us from the beautiful and abundant life available to us and from the Lord and by the Spirit. Anybody ever experienced that? It's a lack of joy. It's a lack of peace. It's a lack of just understanding of what life is about. That happens when we're excluded from the life of God. And this is why. It's because of our own ignorance. Because of the hardness of our heart. I know it says they because he's talking to Christians that aren't supposed to be walking, but he's encouraging us to not walk as these people, which means, guess what? Christians can walk as if they have no relationship with the Lord. Have you ever found that out about yourself? Yeah? Let's hope none of us are in that season right now. But if you are, this is for you. <laughs> of course, it's not for you. Wife, elbow your husband. Okay, where, where was I? Because of the hardness of their heart. This is what happens over time. That's why this person's mouth is doing this. He or she is sad because the hardness of their heart has caused the life of God to not be flowing in this person that God originally created. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality. I know that term means sex to a lot of people, but really what it means is to live by your own feelings. It's to live according to the influences of this world and whatever your feelings and how they respond, that's how you live. Has anybody ever gotten angry because someone was angry with them? Sensuality. Has anybody been hurt because of something mean said to you? That's sensual. When Jesus says, love your enemies, that's not sensual. That's spirit. To love someone who hates you, to love someone who kills you or wants to, that's not sensual. And he encourages us to not live sensually because they've given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. You did not learn Christ in this way. If you indeed have heard him and have been taught in him, let us pray that's all of us. Just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, everybody say former, former. which means it's not now. now. In reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside, guess what that old self is? It's this, it's this false identity, it's this this person we created outside of relationship with Father. This is our prison that the anointing of Jesus is upon to set us free from. Amen? You lay aside that old self. Remember I talked last week like the word flesh. Anybody remember what the definition of the word flesh is? From the back? Nice job, Autumn. It's the part to be removed. So after a winter walk and you get in the house, what's the first thing you can't wait to do? 
Take off your coat. You have walked into the light. You've walked into the warmth of your Father. You have now have the life of God. The first thing you should do is take off your flesh. I'm so glad you're all here today. So three people can respond. You lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. See, what that actually means is when we walk according to that old self, to that former manner of life, we actually feed something that's supposed to be starved, that's supposed to be removed. We, if we feed this, it grows. And it feels like, and this is the part that, this is the lie. The lie is the more it grows, the more it feels like us. And over time, if you spend so long in your former manner of life, according to the old self, you can become convinced that someone you're not is who you are. And there's people all throughout the world and maybe even in this room today who believe lies about themselves. And it's not who you are. Okay? Okay? Oh, I could stay there. I want to stay there, but I want to get to good, really good things. Which is being corrupted in the accordance with the lusts of deceit. Right there, deceit. Lies that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. This guy needs renewed. This one. Renewed means you were once new, got old, got beat up, got messed up, and now you need to be renewed. You put on the what? The new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. My belief, my understanding scripturally of the whole of scripture, this is the new self. And it's not necessarily, and actually the words they're putting on and putting on where it says, uh, hold on, lay aside the old self and put on the new self. It almost sounds like you're taking off one coat and putting on another coat. That's not the original language there. It is the taking off of the flesh. If you look at the original language of the word flesh, it means to take off. But to put on, you can't renew something and put it on at the same time. It's either renewed or it's put on. And that's why I don't always like the way we translated the, uh, the original words into the English because this actually is the idea of removing a coat to shine forth the glory. But if anybody else has ever taken off something that you thought was you, it almost feels like you're brand new. Like it's someone you've never been before. But you've always been this person. Go read Romans 7. You'll actually see it. It says the one that wants to do good is actually a slave to the one outside. So like you have this desire to good, do good. Anybody? Like deep on the inside, you're like, I want to do good. I want to do good. Today is a new day. Mercies are new every morning. Oh, yeah. And then someone cuts you off on the way. <laughs> or someone, here's, here's my favorite. You're in the right lane. Okay? <laughs> you're in the correct lane. And someone's over here, and you know what they want to do, right? This lane's ending in about 400 feet. And so they're going to try to hurry up. Anybody? Yep. How, many people, how many people are this person? <laughs> Oh, you bring out my old self. You bring him out. I want to put my coat on with you. And they scoom on over and I'm just like, Jesus loves you. Oh, I say it all the time, don't I, guys? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a New York merge. That's what we call that. So you're like, I want to do good. I want to do good, but think. Be renewed. Be renewed. That person is just like, maybe they need to get somewhere I don't need to get to. I don't know what it is, but when I am in that place where I am taking off that coat, intentionally taking it off and being renewed in the spirit of my mind, that person is my friend. And I'm like, whoa, they got to get somewhere I don't need to get to. Come on in. I cannot say I'm always that person. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not always that person. Let today be the day where we're all that person, okay? It is Easter. Give them one day. Okay, so <laughs> go to Romans 6. I got to move forward. It's already 1135. You guys probably have ham in the oven or something. 
I don't know what you have, but... Okay, so let's get to the good stuff, okay? So I'm going to finally draw more. You know what that is, right? I'm going to have to shorten this because my drawing is getting squeezed. Okay, that's a cross, okay, in case you were wondering. I can't really mess that up, right? It's a lopsided cross, but I did it for a reason. Verse 1, Romans chapter 6. Everybody there? In your paper Bibles, are you there? Yes. All right. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. This is something really important. Look, uh, let me start drawing now. Okay, this is where it's going to get bad. I am warning you. I am terrible at this. But if I try to tell somebody else... Okay. Steve, you, there's nothing to laugh at over there, right? You can't see it anyway. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I want you to see something really important here about the cross. You can, can, still, you can still continue in sin after the cross. Now, I know my, that might feel like a duh to a lot of people, but it's really important for you guys to realize that the one who said it is finished, who dealt with our sin once and for all, okay, this is Jesus, doesn't destroy sin on the other side of the cross. You and I are so free, like I prayed at the, last, at the end of last time, that you can still sin. Now for me, there's something really important about that because if he said it was finished, yet you can still sin on the other side of the cross, there are some things that he didn't finish that we are to. This is really important for me, okay? I have some preachers say, and I've heard this kind of preaching, when he said it is finished, it's all done. There is nothing left for us to do except to wait. Jesus, take me in that chariot. I want to go to the sky. to my little cabin in the corner of heaven. But there's something about this Romans chapter 6 that changes my mind about that. There's something more for us. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Do you know that you can die to sin and then resurrect it? This is important. Resurrection powers on the inside of you and you have the authority to resurrect whatever you want. You can resurrect your old self. You can resurrect and fully walk in your new self. You have that authority. That's the finished work of Jesus. Jesus finishes and hands the authority back to Adam who lost it. And now we have the authority to walk in the fullness of the finished work or to creep back. And it is not good enough to be freed from sin and to resurrect it. To have power over it, yet still live in it. Let's keep going. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Here's the really important thing for me. Here, what changes over here, okay, yeah, I know, Gumby plus a donut. I don't, I don't even know what this thing is anymore. Okay? How many people still struggle with the false self? Yeah. Raise your hand. Okay. Now, I, I want you to read this, and I want you to think in terms of this person and over here on this person. Because something had to happen in the cross. Something had to happen that changed this person forever. It didn't just put a smile on his face. There has to be more. I want to read verse 3 again. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, and the word baptism to the reader in this time meant someone that went down in the water with Jesus and then comes back up. Okay? 
It's a baptism into Jesus and a resurrection or resurrection with him and have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that, this is why we were baptized into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Really important for you guys to understand. Jesus on this side of the cross, was he sinless or walk in sin? I need everybody to say sinless with me. I just need to make sure we're on the same page. Some of you are like, I'm afraid to even answer this question. I'm not sure what he's going to do. Did he walk in sin or not? No, he was sinless. That's why he was the unblemished lamb. That's why he was the worthy substitution for us. Okay? So Jesus on the cross is sinless and dies. So when he resurrects, does he have any of this? Of course not. He never created a false version of Jesus. He only ever was himself. And by, with the same authority that you have, he overcame sin. He lived in relationship with his father by the spirit of his father. So far so good? Okay, so we, you and me and all of humanity, have this thing. So when Jesus resurrects, he resurrects with a glorified body. He walks through walls, but he still has scars in his hands. He still has holes. He still has stuff going on. So it looks like, oh my gosh, that is Jesus. You can see Thomas found out. He put his finger in his hand. So on the other side of the cross, Jesus has something, sorry, doesn't have what we have. We on the other side of the cross still have this, but something changes here. Let me just keep going here. Five. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Do you hear that? I want to read it again. If we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Everybody say, shall be. That means what he looked like in the resurrection, we say shall be. Shall be. But what he didn't have going into the cross, we do. Do you guys hear me? He didn't have a false identity. So when he was on the other side of the cross, there was nothing to take off. He wasn't Lazarus coming out of the grave and he tells the people around, unbind him. You guys remember this? So when we're on the other side of the cross, this sin is condemned, the Bible says. This sin is condemned in the flesh. This is condemned. Hello? And by the way, if you go read Romans 7, which we don't have time, sin does not dwell here. Sin dwells in your flesh. Paul says it. So far, so good? This is really important. That's why this guy can smile on the other side of the cross because he recognizes, oh my gosh, I'm not who I thought I was. I'm this incredible creature created in the likeness and image of God. Sin is not who I am. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Sin is not my identity. Yeah. Woo! That's exciting. Because for some of us, even after the cross, sin is still our identity. But Jesus' blood somehow protects us from an angry God who hates sin. Here's the realization. Sin is not who you are. Sin covers who you are. Do you guys hear this? This is such a different understanding that we've been taught for too long. You can get away from your sin. If you were born with it, you can't get away from it. But if it's not your original identity, you can take it off and walk in newness of life. Okay, so here comes the fun part. The Bible says that Jesus himself condemned sin in the flesh, crucifying it on the cross. Hello? Okay. He didn't kill it though. Has anybody ever heard of a criminal being condemned? What does that mean? Somebody shout out. What does it mean to be condemned like in a court of law or whatever? You're found guilty. Who was found guilty on the cross? Sin. All right. I, I can't even write well. Is guilty. And guess what its punishment is? Death. Death. Okay, now, 
Oh, this is so much fun, it hurts. Okay. What Jesus didn't have on the other side of the cross, we have. What he finished on the cross, now we finish. Who is the one that carries out the penalty against sin? Come on, everybody say we do. No, we do. See, Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. This is really important. We were baptized into his death. We now resurrect. And it says that we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. What he looked like on the other side of resurrection, free from any false identity, free from any hint of sin. Now we have the authority as a son and daughter, because that's who you are. Everybody say, I'm the firstborn among many brethren. Sorry, Jesus is the firstborn. I'm the many brethren. Don't repeat after me. That's stupid. <laughs> Jesus is the firstborn. And he's the firstborn among many brethren. That's you. That's me. And it says that we shall be in the same likeness that he had on the other side of the cross. This is going to get good. I promise you. If it isn't already. All right. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. Listen, 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 listen. In order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is free from sin. This is what is to die. Not us. This is really important. When Jesus teaches us to take up our cross and follow him, there's this understanding that we, this person, has to die in order for Jesus' purposes to be fulfilled in our lives. That's not true. What needs to die is this. This person you think you are. This person that the world and the relationships in your life prior to the cross convinced you you are. This is who has to die so this person can be abundantly alive. How are we doing? Verse 8. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. Even so, here it is, here it is, listen to this. Even so, consider yourselves, this guy, dead to this guy. Okay, which means you still have the authority to keep this person alive. Resurrection power dwells here. You have the authority to keep giving life to something that's dead. You can resurrect it if you want to. Or you can use this resurrection power. Now I need to start erasing again. You guys all know this. Sin is condemned in the flesh. Sin is guilty. Right? We're all good? Okay. So here's what happens next. Oh, this is so exciting. Okay. So I'm going to draw. Uh, it's got a dryer. I can't write. Oh, man. Okay. It's okay. Here's what's supposed to happen. Just give me a minute. You let Bob Ross have a minute, right? When he's drawing, he, even though he talks. And... Okay, what's changing? Okay, dude's getting taller. He's getting some weird appendages. His... his... <laughs> His trunk is getting longer. His arms are getting shorter. What do you see? What's getting smaller? Sin is getting smaller. What else is getting smaller? Flesh. Eventually, here's what I believe. Go to, now go back to Ephesians. Were you already there? Go back there. I'm trying to finish up so you guys can have fun together as family, but this is so important. I know this is a lot of theology, but I just pray that you can hear this. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. 
This is right after uh, Paul is talking talking about the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher have been given to the church for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Verse 13, you ready? You there? Let's do it. Verse 13, Karis, I love you. You're awesome. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. That word knowledge is the Greek word epignosis, and it doesn't mean so that we know more about Jesus. That's an understanding that we had about knowledge. It's not true. It actually is like in Acts when the disciples are going around doing everything Jesus was doing and someone comes up to him and says, wait, 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 wait. We recognize you. And it actually uses these words. You have been with Jesus. Why did they know that they had been with Jesus? He was doing what he'd done. He was walking as they had walked. He had walked. They were walking as he had walked. This understanding of until we all attain to the unity of faith, that word attain, that word means to grow and to, and to fill up into the unity of the faith, to grow and fill up into the knowledge, the same person of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Do you guys see that? Look at my wonderful picture drawing and listen to these words again. I'm just going to read this. Just look at it if you want to. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried away by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. We cannot any longer live according to this. This thing gets blown around. This thing has no understanding of who it is. This person is rock solid because the rock is right here. This is sand. The flesh stands on sand. And every time a new influence comes around that sounds good, the flesh goes over and agrees with that. And whoever else comes along and pushes them the other way, they agree with that. Anybody ever been there before? I don't know what I believe. I don't know what to think about this. I don't know how to do this. That's your flesh. Who you are as a son and daughter of the Father knows who they are. Keep reading. It gets better. Oh my gosh. Look. Verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, we are to, everybody say, grow up. Grow up. This is what Christianity is after the cross. It's about growing up. It's about maturing. Back to the very first uh, of 13. To a mature man. But keep going. We are to grow up into how many aspects into him? Everybody say all really loud. All. There is not to be a missing aspect of Jesus Christ on the earth. Not one. We as human beings together are to bring about the fullness of Jesus on the earth. Amen. Yeah, come on, come on. You need to tell me that's good because that's good. That's our future. And here's the thing. Let it stop being our future. Because this word is until we attain. I am tired of waiting for the until. I am tired of us thinking, oh, we're just going to go to heaven and oh, we'll see what happens after that. No, there has to be a people that decide that what this scripture is saying will happen on earth as it is in heaven. Finish it, finish it, finish it, finish it. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head. He is the source. That word head, I know he's using body language a lot, but that word simply means source. Kephele, that's the Greek word, which means source. The point from which all things flow. That's who Jesus is. We're to grow up into all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by every joint supplying according to the proper working of each part causes the what? The growth of the body for the building of itself up in love. This is us. As this grows, as we resurrect this person, as we walk in the fullness of this resurrection, this is the shall be of Romans 6. This is who Jesus was on the other side of the cross. 
This is who resurrected and went up to heaven in Acts. This is who we shall be. And it's not up to Jesus anymore. He already did the work of condemning sin in the flesh. He's done. And now he sits at the right hand of God the Father. Grace is just being poured out. Grace, which is the divine influence of God. Divine influence of God. That doesn't make any sense. Divine influence, the life source, this is what grace is, upon your heart. And then it's reflection in life. Guys, every single time we choose to resurrect this person instead of this person is called repentance. It's a lost word in Christianity. It's not a one time I turn away from the world and I turn toward Jesus. No, repentance is an ongoing change and renewing of the mind where we turn from being sourced from the world to being sourced in the head. And every time we do that, this person resurrects a little bit more. Resurrects a little bit more. See, resurrection and repentance to me are synonymous. Every time I turn, I grow. Every time I turn, I grow. Every time I turn, I grow. And every time I grow, I shed that which used to hide me and keep me imprisoned. And eventually, I put to death the very thing Jesus, the judge, the righteous judge, condemned. The thing that was killing my father's children. I have condemned it to death. But the only way my children will be free is if they execute my judgment. Do you guys hear this? Yes. This is important. Life is not about paying bills and getting your kids to college. This is what your life is about. This guy will go to college and will invent stuff and will pay off mortgages. I promise you. This is one of the things I'm seeing so much. Commercial break. And I know, uh, aren't there commercials right at the end of a show? And then it comes back for like a final. Okay, so here is the commercial right before the. Okay. I think, hey, buddy, how are you? There is a way color? for Christians. Not yet. Don't color yet. Just wait a little bit. Just wait a little bit. He is so ready to color on this whiteboard. It's not even funny. <laughs> He's saying, it's all black and white. We need some color on there. <laughs> Here's what Christianity has shown the world for too long. You're either hot for God or you're good at your responsibilities in this world. And I think that season needs to be over. We have perpetuated that season long enough. You know, you can be passionate. You can be on fire. You can be a loving, focused, and faithful son and daughter of God and pay your bills and run companies and run for office. You don't have to give up one to do the other. And I think it's time when we start doing this, I, I'm telling you, I don't have to take off my flesh as much as I have to grow this person. If I grow and as I walk as Christ walked, as I continue to turn and repent from this lifestyle that's not me, these offenses and these hurts and these insecurities and this anger issues of this guy trying to get in front of me so he can get the sheets before I can get the sheets and then he's going to get the gas pump that I want. <laughs> if I just let that go... Now you know how my brain works. <clears throat> if I just keep turning, every time I turn, Christ in all aspects of him enters the earth. Every time I turn, sin re is reminded of its death judgment and the aspects of the fullness of Christ grow in the earth. This is destiny. Why do we keep putting destiny off for the future? Why do we keep putting it off for another generation while our kids are going to just be great? I am tired of talking about the kids being great. If I'm great, the kids will already be great. That's the problem. We have not so great parents hoping kids will be great. Hello? I'm talking about you. I'm talking to you. It has been long enough where you have agreed with who you're not. You are agreeing with a dead man walking. And you're bringing to life that which was never meant to be alive. 
And you're wasting, can I say this? Wasting resurrection power. Let's stand. I want us as a people to start seeing all of this, not just Jesus as a person sitting on a throne or however you picture him. All of this is Christ. He is no longer himself apart from us. You guys know that, right? At the end of Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, it says we are the fullness of him who fills all in all. He is no longer complete without us. If you start thinking of this as Christ, maybe that would inspire you to not live according to this person any longer. Because every time we decide, ah, I'm going to be lazy today. Ah, I'm going to choose to look at that today. Ah, I'm going to choose to say this to this person. We hinder the fullness of Jesus in the earth. I pray for a spirit of conviction to come upon all of us right now in Jesus' name. I know it's supposed to be all, oh, hallelujah, Easter bunnies, Easter sermon. No, actually, I think we need convicted by the Spirit of God that we are not this person that we keep resuscitating. Holy Spirit, remind us of who we are. Remind us of the glory with which you created us. The thoughtfulness, the attention with which you created us. Remind us right now in this moment, even what you were thinking about when you were forming us. I pray that this not just be words, hurry up, Mark, finish praying. I pray that this would go deep into the marrow of your bones. Because your soul remembers. He was there. And he was shaping me. And if we could catch a glimpse of what he was thinking about. And how in awe he was of who, of who he was making. Then maybe we'd be a little more aware of our own life. And how valuable it is. And we would turn. We would source ourselves in the one who thought of us and then shaped us and gave us life. Jesus, thank you for not staying in the grave. Thank you for rising again. And I pray among all of us that no one could say of us, I found the living among the dead. I refuse to be found in my false self anymore. And when I do, I repent and I turn and I come back and I speak resurrection power into who I really am. I want people to say about us what the angels said about Jesus. He is not here. He is not here anymore. He is here. Let it be said of all of us, I am not in this person. I am not this hurt, offended, angry, calloused, excluded from the life of God person. That is not who I am. This is who I am. And I source myself in my Father who created this one. And the world will change. And light will get brighter. And the kingdom will grow stronger. And more people just by momentum will see the goodness of God in us. So Father, may we honor Easter well by living the life provided us. In Jesus' name, amen. I love y'all.
Happy Easter!